Let us pray. O God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and in love. Amen. So, finally, at long last, this is the first Sunday in Lent. Lent is a time for many things. Lent is a time for spiritual renewal, for spiritual practices, for commitments, for new life. Lent is also a time when in the Church, in its great acumen, engages in coruscant conviviality and proficious ebullience to push into sexpedalian perspicacity in order to achieve superabundant circumlocution whatever that means. Or in other words, this is the time of the year the Church brings out our most expensive and biggest words. This is that time of year that we ask, as we ask each year, wait, what's Ash Wednesday again? What is Lent again? What day of the week is Monday Thursday this year? And once you embrace those words, we will offer even more expensive words. What is redemption? What is covenant? What is temptation? I mean, really, what is temptation? What is sacrifice? Really? What is salvation? Really? Lent, more than any other time of the year, is a time when history, tradition, theology, ritual, and other factors get wrapped together in fascinating and unpredictable ways. It's a good thing Lent lasts 46 days, so we have time to connect and reconnect, engage and re-engage in what is an important part of the journey of faith. Lent is a good time to ask questions and to be open to new answers. Now, to be clear, I'm not critical of what I call expensive words. I just think we need to explore them and not just gloss over their meaning. You may recall our media went nuts a few years ago around the word temptation. They claimed that the Pope was proposing to change the Lord's Prayer. I know we talked about this a bit in August, but if you missed the story, the Pope was suggesting we change the English translation and to change it from lead us not into temptation to do not let us fall into temptation or do not let us enter into temptation. The pivotal issue was whether or not God would even lead us into temptation, or whether in spite of God's graces, we sometimes enter into temptation ourselves. So to be clear, the Pope was not trying to change the Lord's Prayer. The prayer that the Catholic Church often refers to as simply the Our Father, or in Latin, Pater Noster. The Pope was only suggesting that the English translation could be improved. It was simply a problem with the English version that does not exist in many other languages. But the story is testament to the power of words, and I was actually very impressed that the media went crazy over this. Well, we'll come back to temptation in a little bit. But another expensive word for this week is covenant. In our reading from Genesis today, the word covenant was used seven times. And in all seven instances, I think the word was actually used incorrectly. Now, of course, covenant has various definitions. But I think in all definitions, covenant implies and requires relationship. Covenant requires connection. Covenant covenant requires commitment from at least two parties. The covenant named in Genesis today is only a commitment from God to never commit genocide again using a flood. But where is the other half of that commitment? Where is the commitment from Noah? Or perhaps by extension from us? How do we fit into this story anyway? Some scholars think Noah's commitment is implicit, that perhaps because God slaughtered all the bad people, that Noah, and by extension we, we must be committed to being good people. Perhaps that's our commitment and our connection to the story. But for one thing, the story doesn't actually say that. And for another thing, well, how well did that plan work out in the story anyway? 
One way to look at that is to ask yourself, how many generations, and according to the Genesis story, how many generations did it take before those good people that God had spared from the flood became not so good in the end? How long did it take, in other words, for community, for humanity to go to hell in a handbasket again? If you're not sure the answer, you can count the generations on one hand. Actually, you can count the generations on one finger because it only took one generation for evil to reemerge in society. In verse 9, God is making a covenant with all people, present and future, all of the environment actually, all of humanity. But by verse 25, Noah has already been raped by one of his sons and is condemning that son, Ham, and his descendants forever. Even worse, Noah is singling out one of his sons, Shem, for praise. And so, 16 verses after God declares all people to be God's children, Noah is segregating people and their descendants for all time back into good and evil. The situation at the end of the flood story was no better than the situation at the beginning of the flood story. In fact, the situation at the end of the flood story is no different than the situation at the beginning of the flood story. The flood and the genocide accomplished nothing. So I always wonder when I reflect on that, if maybe the problem is that it would have worked better if the covenant had actually been a part of relationship. Because we, simple human beings that we are, need to actually be involved in our own redemption. Our redemption requires relationship. Otherwise, it might be like a good example, but think of all the Canadians you know that actually want reconciliation with Indigenous people that don't realize that until all the parties are included around the table, you can't have reconciliation. That's a different sermon, though. But the point is, we need to be involved in our own redemption. It's not something that can be given from one side, even if it's God. I find it a bit ironic that that message does not really come across in the flood story in the Bible. However, it does come across in a modern retelling of the flood story from 2007. I mean, of course, the movie Evan Almighty. In one scene in that movie, God is talking to one of the characters, and the character has expressed her disappointment that God had not provided what she wanted in life. Simple things like patience, courage, love. And the God character, played by Morgan Freeman, said, Let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, do you think God gives them patience? Or does God give them an opportunity to be patient? If they pray for courage, does God give them courage? Or does God present them with opportunities to be courageous? It's a very interesting idea, actually. The idea that if we pray for something, maybe what we're actually given are opportunities to practice. Opportunities to get better at the thing we claim we want to be better at. Now, I know it's very natural to pray for a silver bullet solution to our problems. But we are involved in our own redemption. Thanks be to God for that. I wonder if Jesus heard that same call to be involved in redemption that way in today's gospel story. In the part of the story where Jesus went alone into the wilderness in order to reflect, meditate, and seek some clarity around his life and ministry. I always find it interesting that Jesus felt the need to get away and to reflect on his life and his ministry. In fact, Jesus' trip into the wilderness hopefully is a lot like our own call to a Lenten journey this year. Because whatever else Lent means to you, it is certainly an opportunity. An opportunity to find space, to reflect on our own lives, our relationships, our sense of ministry and calling. It's an opportunity to find space to reflect on our faith and our own relationships. And let's face it, if Jesus needed to get away to have time to reflect should be pretty obvious we all need that too. 
When Jesus went to the wilderness to reflect, he faced temptations. In Mark's version, we don't get a lot of detail. But in Matthew, Jesus faces three specific temptations. If you recall, the first temptation was to turn stones into bread. The second was to throw himself off the temple and to let the angels save him. And the third was to become master of the whole world. Well, what do you think of those three temptations? Do you think they apply to us too? And if not, are there modern day equivalents that would apply to us? I would be asking you this if you're here in person. I'd love to know what you think, but you can share your observations at coffee time after service. <clears throat> but I think the temptation to turn rocks into bread was a temptation to feed the world. Interestingly, Jesus rejected that. Jesus is not a baker. Moreover, in other places in the gospel, Jesus says, the poor you will have with you always. And we do not live by bread alone. And you know, in countless stories in the gospels, Jesus wanders around to many villages speaking and teaching and healing. I don't know if you've ever noticed or not, Jesus in the stories does not ever hand out anything. He doesn't give out bread. He doesn't give out money. What he gives is his time and his compassion, and apparently those were enough. So what is a modern-day equivalent of that? Is it still a contemporary temptation to turn rocks into bread? I mean, given the fact many people in our own community suffer from food insecurity, maybe it is relevant. Maybe Jesus should have been a baker after all. But for me, the temptation, when I try to put it into modern terms, was to satisfy physical needs while ignoring spiritual and emotional needs. I mean, how often are we tempted to write a check for a very good charity halfway around the world while we ignore the spiritual and emotional needs of people we see on our own streets? With the pandemic, our traditional ways of sharing food in our community are not working right now. But we are still able to reach out and connect with people who are isolated and lonely. This is actually a fantastic time to be sensitive to the emotional needs of our community. The modern temptation, I think, is for us to wait for the pandemic to be over before we think we're in a position to reach out again. The opportunity is right now. We don't need to wait for anything. So I think a modern equivalent to the first temptation is to say, We'll get to that after the pandemic is over. The second temptation was to let for Jesus to throw himself off a building and have the angels catch him so he didn't come to any harm. But to me, this is like an invitation to become a miracle worker, to be seen as a freak. But Jesus rejects the image of miracle worker. Perhaps that's why, particularly in Mark, when Jesus heals someone, he often asks a person to not tell other people about it. Jesus performed miracles, but Jesus did not want to limit his ministry to just that, a circus act. I mean, miracles are cool, but they're always limited to a specific time and place. What is a modern equivalent of the temptation to be a miracle worker? I think personally I understand the temptation to be a miracle worker from the flip side. In other words, the temptation is to believe we have to be exceptional people in order to do valuable things. That we, you and I, are excused from reaching out because we are not exceptional people. I think the temptation is to think we need to be miracle workers to make a difference to somebody else. But that's wrong. All of us, all of us have the capacity to reach out and help others. So I think a modern equivalent of the second temptation is to think we are not good enough, rich enough, powerful enough to make a difference. And so we do not even try. The third temptation, to become the master of the world. I never know if that sounds tempting or not. But Jesus resists the image to be a powerful ruler. I mean... Jesus not only spends his ministry with the homeless and unemployed, Jesus spends his ministry as one who himself is homeless and unemployed. 
what today we perhaps would call a bum, seeming to have no interest at all in power in the conventional sense. It's almost as if Jesus has an image of ministry where he is not the center of attention. What is the modern equivalent of the temptation to acquire power? Well, I seriously doubt anyone listening to me today is somebody who actually amasses vast amounts of power and wealth. But how often are we pretend, tempted to pretend that we are in control of things? How often do we fail to, the, to listen to the wisdom of all people? You know, if you listen to other people carefully and you realize that all of us carry fear and pain within us, but at the same time that each of us carries our own deep wisdom, we can get further along. We are all in this together. Power and control are delusions anyway. So I think a modern equivalent of the third temptation is to think that we already have all the answers and therefore we do not need to listen to other voices. So what do you think of those three takes on modern temptations? I look forward to hearing from you at coffee time or at any time. But I think, <clears throat> I think if we put Jesus' temptations into more modern terms, perhaps they apply to us after all. I wonder if we are willing, at least during Lent, to consider those temptations and how they might affect our own faith, ministry, and lives. Lent is a journey and an opportunity. Make time for it. Embrace it. Live into it. What is around the next corner on your faith journey? Well, perhaps by the end of Lent, you will see just a bit further around that corner. And I pray that we all do. Let's have a nice trip. And remember, we do not journey alone. We journey together. And I look forward to seeing you on the path. Amen.